decent liberal people who I regard as my own people, I've always been among, among those people, who I regard as cowards because they, um, they cave in and they do not observe their principles of feminism, of gay rights, uh, all the things that decent liberal people believe. Suddenly they forget about them when it comes to Islam. To get Brexit. America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun and today I'm interviewing Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is one of the world's leading atheists. He's written several books on religion and science including The God Delusion which was a bestseller. We're going to be talking all about atheism, religion, ideologies and Brexit. So Richard Dawkins, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Where does religion come from? Well, I think it partly comes from, uh, well, history, obviously. Um, if you ask why it comes, where it comes from in an individual, it comes from childhood and indoctrination and education. Where does it come from historically? Well, I suspect originally from primitive animistic beliefs, sun gods, fire gods, river gods, um, flood gods, storm gods, etc. People have a natural tendency to wonder what causes things, and people have a natural tendency, which I suspect comes from their evolutionary background, to ascribe agency to things, like if there's a bad thunderstorm, that must be the gods getting angry. There's, there's a tendency to want to think that there's an agent behind everything that happens. There's a rain god that brings the rain, there's a sun god that, that, that traversals across the, the sky, and so on. It's a very natural impulse, and I think you can even give it a kind of evolutionary explanation. Um, our ancestors obviously were in danger all the time from predators, and uh, so they were constantly, as it were, looking over their shoulder, looking, wondering whether that could be, a, could be a leopard, could be a lion. So something that isn't a lion, but is just a sort of rustling in the trees, um, or a leopard up in the trees, um, it might be a leopard. And so the safest thing is to assume that it is, even though actually most of the time the trees rustle, it's, it's not, it's just the, just the wind. So animism arises from that, from the tendency to ascribe agency to everything that happens. And then it developed by cultural evolution over time into a more sophisticated kind of animism where you believe there's one God who does everything and creates the world and so on. Do you think overall, throughout history, we've seen religion do more bad than good? Yes, although I don't think that's the most important question to ask. As a scientist, I think whether it's true is the most important question to ask. Um, I think it's done more bad than good. Uh, I suppose it's done, we can see some good that it does more recently, I suppose, because um, religion does, I suspect, tend to make people nicer to each other in some respects, not very many respects. Um, but no, on, on the whole, I think it's it done much more bad than good. So your pursuit throughout your whole life, um, and I, I've read lots of your work and I've watched lots of your interviews, is all about that word truth, finding the yes, truth. Yes, it is. It Why is, is that? Where does that well, come well, from? If, if that's true for any scientist. Uh, any, any scientist uh, thinks there is such a thing as truth and that it's out there for us to discover and that it's the business of science to discover it. And it's a wonderful challenge. It's, it's, it's a, a beautiful thing that, that we are equipped with our brains and our sense organs to discover what the truth about the world is. So we've seen thousands of years of history of religion and then it wasn't until very recent, relative, in relative terms, that the growth of atheism happened. Where, did, where was atheism born? I mean, where, what, what are the sort of historical precedents of that? You know, I think it would have been very difficult to be an atheist before Darwin because we are surrounded by a world of incredible complexity and beauty, actually. Uh, and everything about the living world screams design. Uh, if you look at the way a body works, look at the way a, any, a body of any animal or any plant works, it's clearly designed, you might think. And it took an, an act of immense, I, th I think courage is the right word, for a Darwin to come along and say, no, it doesn't have to be designed. There is a mechanistic explanation. It can be explained 
in exactly the same way as any other physical process can be explained. That was a big, big surprise, and I think it's not all that surprising that it took until the mid-19th century before anybody took that leap of courage. And the consequences for those people who did take that leap was pretty drastic, correct? I mean, what, can you talk about the kind of the, the history of atheism and the consequences of becoming an atheist and coming out, as it were, as an atheist in society and, and up until today? Well, in the 19th century, it, it wasn't that bad. I mean, you couldn't get killed for it in the, in the Western world anyway. Nowadays, you can get killed for it in the Islamic world, um, which is an, another matter. But, um, you know, when, when Darwin and Wallace came along, uh, the, the, the worst they got was, was a bit of pillorying in the, in the papers and the, and the reviews and things. Um, earlier on, I suppose, in, I mean, you could get killed for being the wrong kind of Christian, let alone being an atheist. I want to talk about where your atheism comes from. So obviously you were brought up um, uh, until I think you were seven in colonial Africa. Um, you believed in God, you believed in religion? Well, I, I was sent to Anglican schools and uh, as, as you know, I mean, it, it, it's not like, it, you're not, it's not exactly thrust down your throat in a, in a very harsh way. But nevertheless, you go to chapel every, every Sunday and you have prayers every day and so Yes, so naturally I believed it along with all my schoolfellows, uh, and well, until I was about 15 or 16. And the main reason that you changed your mind was what? Science, uh, because by the time I reached the age of about uh, 14 or 15, the main reason why I retained religious belief was science but the wrong science. I mean, I, I was impressed by the beauty of the living world. I was doing, I was studying biology I, and I, as, as I said before, everything about the living world screams design and so I, I, I believed that. And so when I finally understood Darwinism, uh, that immediately pulled the rug from under my religious belief because my religious belief at that stage had, had become only one of the so-called argument from design. One thing that sort of stumps me about this argument about design um, and, and evolution, obviously evolution I think is pretty much you know, almost 99% accepted around the world that evolution is, is real. In no, the case not, of, not, not around the world, but... It, within in, science, in, within yes. the scientific community, that's yeah, what in, I meant. Yes, yes. Um, but there's that question about where life began and where we came from something extremely simple sort of elements and molecules and the amino acids to something extremely complex that is DNA. I mean, the difference is, is huge. So that question that religious people might ask is, well, how can we go from something so basic to something so complex, infinitely complex to the human, I mean, much more complex than computers, for example? How can we go from that without it being designed? Yeah, that, that's an extremely good question. Um, the, once you've got DNA, um, then everything else follows, uh, and we understand how that, how that happened. And that, that was the big one, really. That, that, I mean, because the, the complexity of a, of, a, of, a, of a horse or an elephant or a human or an oak tree is, is simply gigantic. And so getting to there, from the origin of life, something simpler than a bacterium is the big one, and Darwin solved that. But we still have another fairly big one, which is how do you get from pure chemistry to the first self-replicating molecule? It wouldn't have been DNA, because DNA, as you rightly say, is too complex. It would have to be something else, a precursor of DNA, which, by presumably some precursor of natural selection, built up gradually to be as complex as DNA. So what we're looking for is a molecule which has the singular property of self-replication, of making copies of itself in the way that DNA does. It can't have been DNA because DNA requires for its replication its own product, which is the sequencing of proteins. So it had to be something simpler than DNA and something that could work on its own without the catch-22 that DNA suffers from. The catch-22 of DNA is that DNA requires protein in order to replicate and protein requires DNA in order to get, to get sequenced. Um, well, the currently most fashionable theory for that is the so-called RNA world theory. RNA 
as you know, is rather like DNA. It, it, it also has the same kind of sequence of similar bases. Um, and it is now a mediator between DNA and protein. It's a vital mediator. The reason why DNA needs protein is that pr protein is an enzyme, is a catalyst. And uh, the beauty about RNA is that it has both the property of being a catalyst, like protein, an enzyme, and it has the property of being a replicator, like DNA. It's not a good replicator like DNA, and it's not a good enzyme like protein, but it's fairly good at doing both. And so if RNA had sprung into existence in a world of primitive chemistry, then it had the capacity to, to, to get over to the Catch-22 problem. And that's, as I said, the current most fashionable idea. It's not um, fleshed out, it's, it's in a very rough state, but at least RNA has the capacity to, uh, to bypass the, this Catch-22. It's interesting because you've come up with a fantastically uh, interesting scientific explanation for that question that I've just asked. And religious people would say, well, actually, you know, science can't or haven't, hasn't come up with a serious answer to that question yet. Therefore, it must have been a god or therefore it must have been yeah, I mean, someone that, of course, uh, is, is, is a designed. pathetic lack of, lack of logic. I mean, um, science, of course, has gaps in, in, in it and those gaps are waiting to be solved. But to say because science has a gap, therefore religion can, can fill that gap is utter nonsense. I mean, religion has not the faintest idea how to fill the gap. Um, at least science is working on the problem. You cannot say, um, we have here two possible I I ideas, A and B. A has got an enormous amount of success under its belt, but it's got one or two little gaps that are still remaining to be filled. B has absolutely nothing going for it, but because there's a gap in A's understanding, therefore B must fill it. Utterly illogical. I want to talk about logic because you've, you've come up with a very interesting um, uh, you know, uh, phrase there that the religion has no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, yet, it has survived for thousands of years, almost all throughout all of human history. We can look back on and we can see kind of elements of religion in various, in almost every society, I suppose. In, I would say probably existed. every society. In every society. So how can something with no evidence, as you say, survive for so long, even to today, with modern science? Yes, well, I, th I suppose you have to say to that, unfortunately, people don't necessarily realise how important evidence is. Um, I think the, 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 the key to it is quite largely childhood indoctrination. Um, if you are told at a sensitive age early on in your life that so-and-so is the case, then it's quite hard to shake that off. And we see this really rather dramatically in uh, th things like people, say, who've been brought up as Roman Catholics, cradle Catholics, as they're, as they're called. And they grow up and they become highly educated, highly intelligent people. And they say to them something like, this is, I've often met this, you, they say things like, well, rationally I can see that it's complete nonsense, but I can't shake it off. Um, I, it, it's something about what I was ta taught in childhood, and, and it's, I, you know, I'm, I'm still terrified of going to hell. And the power of indoctrination at an early, sensitive age is remarkably strong. That's a pretty strong word, indoctrination. Do you, it kind of implies, or are you implying that it's um, coming from a sort of negative place in that, you know, the people's um, purposes are a negative one? I mean, no, those I don't people think probably, so. they no, probably I, believe it themselves. Yes, yes they, of course they believe it themselves. Um, and, and why wouldn't they? I mean, they were indoctrinated by their parents on, on schools. and they were indoctr I mean, it goes back through the generations. And until, until somebody breaks it, until um, somebody manages to overcome that childhood indoctrination and, and, and refrains from indoctrinating their own children, it's going to go on. Let's talk about breaking that, uh, what you call indoctrination, which has been your life crusade. It's probably a rather uh, different word to use in your context. Um, but you spent you know, your whole, or almost your whole life, fighting against religion, basically trying to make sure that atheism is, is heard and the case for atheism is heard, which is fantastic. Um, do you feel that you're winning that battle? Well, first of all, I don't think I've spent my life doing it. I mean, most of my books, I've written about 14 books now, mm. and, and all but two of them have been about science. Uh, I mean, insofar as 
the science that I've been writing about implies atheism, that's up to the reader. Um, I think I've only written two books that are actually about atheism. Um, and I would like to think that science is enough. I would like to think that if you really understand the scientific worldview, how powerful it is, how remarkably successful it's been, and how as, it, as time goes by, as the centuries go by, as the decades go by, there's less and less room for supernatural superstition, that people who read science books will draw the obvious conclusion and give up supernatural superstition. Are you winning that, that fight against the supernatural superstition or against religion? Well, if you look at the statistics in Western Europe, well, in Europe and in, even in uh, North America, yes, uh, we are winning. Um, at the, as the decades go by, the number of people who profess a religion is steadily going down, even in the United States. It's now about 25% are saying that they have no religion and that the number is higher for young people and of course it's much higher in Europe. Uh, so we are winning. It's not the case in the Islamic world and that may take a very much longer time. I want to talk, I want to separate truth for a moment which is going to be hard for you um, and talk about sort of outcomes uh, of, of that, of the decline in religion in Western societies. Do you think that that has had positive outcomes? And if it has, can you point to the ones which, you know, can you point to them and show us, look, this is what's happened, now religion is declining, it's fantastic. Well, I'm not a historian. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, and of course, the, the decline of religion probably does have um, blips in the wrong direction. It's, it's probably not a uniform. I mean, for example, in, in Russia, um, uh, atheism was imposed by the communist regime, and now it's re religion is coming back, and that's not that surprising—a sort of rebound effect. So it's not a uniform effect. Um, I think if you look at the broad sweep of history, the long sweep of history, people like um, Steven Pinker have looked at this and concluded that as the centuries have gone by, we're really starting millennia ago, things are getting better. And that coincides with the decline of religion over the, at least over recent centuries. But again, with, with tremendous blips in the wrong direction. I mean, in the 20th century, we've had two horrible, horrific world wars, which clearly buck the trend that Pinker discerned in, 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 in history, and he deals with that. Um, and um, those two wars had nothing to do with religion either way. They were, they were about um, na nationalism um, and the pernicious effects of patriotic, jingoistic nationalism in the case of the First World War and the Second World War was a consequence of the First World War, um, abetted by a, a, a lunatic um, theory of, sort of race, racialism. Um, so the, the two world wars of the, second, of the, of the 20th century are a, are, are a hideous reversal of the, of the overall trend. As I say, they had nothing to do with religion either way. Um, but um, I think you have to take a very long view of history in order to discern long-term trends. Do you think that religion fills a gap in people's headspace? And what I mean by that is religion may give people purpose, it may give people a reason for living, it may give people a kind of moral guidance, a kind of set of rules to live by. And once that, that goes, that gap and vacuum is filled with other things. I mean, it has to be. And we've seen, and you've mentioned the two world wars there, the rise of, let's say, nationalism on the one hand and sort of race, race politics on the other hand, um, that's filled those, potentially filled those gaps and le led to absolute destruction and disaster. Do you, do you think that's a bad thing? Yes, religion does, of course, um, fill headspace, as you say. And um, when it goes, um, some people feel a kind of vacuum. Uh, the vacuum can be as uh, sort of ordinary, if you like, as, as sort of needing a, a place to go on a Sunday to sort of meet your friends and have coffee and things, and, and that can surely be filled. Um, the vacuum and sense of purpose, um, well, that I think is very easily filled by, by <coughs> both science and by a personal sense of purpose. Um, the, um, the global sense of purpose which religion used to fill 
the purpose of the universe, the purpose of life. That is filled by science. We, we understand what the purpose of life is. The universe has no purpose. I mean, why should it have a purpose? But, of course, individuals need to have purposes. The purpose of my getting up in the morning, the purpose of my life for this year, um, I, for the next five years I hope to achieve, and so on. That's, of course, very important. Um, and we all of us fill that gap with um, lots of different things. We all of us have our own purposes. It's entirely understandable from an evolutionary point of view that we should have individual striving for purpose. Um, the global purpose of life in evolutionary terms is the propagation of DNA. Uh, it's as sort of ordinary, as, as mundane as that, as sort of low down as that. But animals, natural selection builds into animals more short-term purposes and sub-purposes and sub-purposes. So the sort of purposes that an animal has are to, to feed itself, to feed its family, to find a home to live in, um, to avoid being eaten, that kind of thing. In, in ourselves, we have rather more grand purposes, like we want to compose a symphony, or we want to write a book, or we want to win a football match. Um, these are parts of the mechanism that the brain sets up to achieve the, the global purpose of survival and DNA propagation. And it needs to do that. So when a, 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 a hyena, is, a pack of hyenas is going hunting, um, they, they have a, a goal, which is to go out and, and hunt a particular kind of antelope, say. And, and we, we, we know that because researchers on hyenas actually can tell what they're going after by the way they behave. So they have a purpose. And then there are sub-purposes, like when you see a prey, um, I don't know how hyenas do it, maybe may crouch down to stalk it or something of that sort. Um, in the case of a, of a cat, like a, like a cheetah, it is stalking. So a cheetah may be have the, have the goal of, of filling its stomach, sub-goal of catching a particular gazelle, and then, uh, then the next sub-goal is searching for the gazelle, the next sub-goal is when you've seen it crouch down so it doesn't see you, and then the next sub-goal is um, get as close as possible before you do your final sprint, and the next sub-goal is when you do your final sprint, catch it. Um, so all those sub-goals are in the service of a global goal, which is um, DNA propagation, um, and then and survival, reproduction, feeding your cubs, and so on. So the, 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 the hierarchy of goals and sub-goals and sub-sub-goals and sub-sub-goals and things is deep within our brains, in the, the brains of all, all animals. And nowadays we fill those goals and sub-goals with things that don't have anything, anything directly to do with survival and reproduction. Things like writing a book, as, as I say. So writing a book doesn't actually improve your reproductive success. But the, the mechanism in the brain to set up goals and sub-goals is still there and is still working away. Uh, even though we now live in cities surrounded by books and buses and cars and computers and things. So that survival is actually not one of our major problems, not one of the problems that we are solving in our everyday life. We don't wake up in the morning and say, what can I do to ensure my survival today? We say, what can I do to finish the chapter I'm writing? But the, the mechanism is still there. The, the brain mechanism that used to be in the service of survival is now in, in other, has been commandeered into other services. It's fascinating because we've talked a bit about how religion may, ha may have had some part in evolution. You've talked there about purpose being it sort of ingrained in all our brains. And perhaps, I mean, my hypothesis, religion was obviously, I think, one of those purposes or helped or helped people guide their purposes in a, in a, dire in a direction. And if we see the decline of religion, um, we see as I say, a vacuum form, and then you've, you're trying to replace that decline of religion with your sort of scientific, atheistic views, all the things that you've mentioned there. Is that one of the hardest things, uh, when arguing against religion, is that one of the har hardest things to argue against? Because in essence, your argument is against human nature, because we've seen religion, as we said, for thousands of years survive because of it, it, it's so vital, almost, well, clearly it's vital to us living in societies. And now, well, as you say, now we don't have that urge to survive, now we don't have that need to survive, fortunately. We've got all those purposes which might be lacking because of the decline of religion. So perhaps is that one of the hardest things to fight against? Well, I think even when people did have, have religion, 
Um, the, the purposes that they followed in any particular day's work would only have a certain amount to do. I mean, it, they, they might have had a sort of purpose of doing, doing God's will or something of that sort, but actually they, they still had purposes like writing a book. It might have been a book about God, but I mean, it, it still was, was the same kind of purpose. I'm not sure that all that much has changed. Um, what worries me rather more when you talk about vacuums is remembering a quote from G.K. Chesterton, who said, I think, something like, when people give up religion, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. And uh, the anything can be other kinds of supernatural nonsense. It can be things like homeopathy and telepathy and, and ley lines and, and um, that kind of thing. Um, so wiz wizards and witches and, and, and angels and, 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 and as to a certain extent that, that does happen. It is true that a sort of new age spaced out nonsense um, does tend to fill the vacuum when people give up religion, but it, it doesn't have to be that way and I don't think it's true of many people. Well, I think the thing that's innate in, in, in humans is not so much religion itself, but, um, a, but various tendencies to um, to um, very psychological predispositions which can manifest themselves as, as religion. So it would be something like, um, uh, if, if you ask the question, why do all societies have, have religion? It's something like um, what they really have is a psychological predisposition like the belief in agency, the tendency to obey authority. After all, one of the main reasons why people um, my, my children believe in religion is the, is the priesthood which indoctrinates them. So there are, there are priests, there are bishops and archbishops and, and grand high wizards and things who, who indoctrinate and, and kind of in many cases run society. Well, all you need is for um, a, a, an innate predisposition to, um, to want to obey authority. And there are very good reasons to want to obey authority, very good evolutionary reasons why you might obey, especially as a child. Um, authority tends to know what's good for you. When you're a child, you tend not to know what's good for you. You're, you're new to the world, and the world of our ancestors was dangerous. And so listening to your elders, listening to your parents, listening to the elders of the tribe, the priests, the shamans, the witch doctors, that was probably a wise thing to do because much of the advice that they gave probably was good advice for how to survive. And for the child brain programmed to believe what you're told, because it's good for you, it's not easy to, to distinguish that which is good for you from that which isn't, which, that which is just, just nonsense. So um, the, the tendency to believe your elders is a good thing and still is a good thing. And, the, and but it's just that in primitive societies that tended to lead to religion, and it doesn't have to lead to uh, to religion. But you're asking me what's the most difficult thing. I don't think that's the most difficult thing. I, I think childhood indoctrination is the, is the most difficult thing. People believe be what they believe because they've been told by their parents. It's extremely hard to shake that. And you can, you can talk rationalism, you can talk science, you can talk evidence till you're blue in the face. But if somebody at the age of four, five, six, has been told something out of a holy book, say, then it's sometimes very hard to shake that. Do you think that emotion comes into it as well? Because it's, it's, a very, it's very much to do with feelings, religion. It's not something you can see, it's something that you feel. The, the cold realities of life versus the kind of more uh, comfortable emotive side. Yes. That, that must be difficult to, to yes, tackle. Yes, well, um, uh, it, it, it is true that feelings can rule, and sometimes people, fe people value their feelings more than evidence, and among those feelings is comfort. Um, I think it's in the case of religion, it's rather a spurious comfort. Um, it's um, yeah, a comfortable belief that there's a father figure who will rescue you when, you when you're in trouble and look after you when you're, when you're in trouble and so on. Um, well, I suppose that could be comforting, but if it's false, do you really want to gain comfort from a falsehood? It's a, it's a philosophical question, that. It's, quite, it's a hard one. Well, it? it's, it's one that, for example, doctors face. When, they, when, they, uh, when, when a doctor diagnoses a, a, fat, a fatal cancer, the doctor has the dilemma of whether to tell the patient, and nowadays they normally do, um, 
but the dilemma has been, would I, would it, is it better for the patient to remain comforted by the belief that it's not cancer? I mean, I suppose a doctor could actually lie and say, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and that would no doubt give comfort. But, um, well, as you say, it's a philosophical question that is much debated, and nowadays doctors tend to tell the truth. I think there's, there's uh, I forget which philosopher it is, but I think they come up with the scenario of you've found out that your uh, best friend is being cheated on, do you tell them or not? And most people would say, well, yes, I'd rather, them, I'd rather know that it, than, rather than live a happy life that was a fake life. Um, anyway, you mentioned earlier talking about the purpose, purpose in life, and you said there's no purpose of the universe, um, but there, you can, each people can have their own individual purposes, and you've mentioned some of the things that that might involve. Do you feel that that's a big hurdle, again, for when, you, when trying to persuade people to come over to your side who think, well, actually, there is a big purpose of the universe. There's a reason that we're all here. Um, and that, is that one of the biggest... Yes, well, in a way, that's things. an aspect of comfort. It's, ra it's rather uncomfortable, in a way, some people think, to live in a universe without any purpose, to feel that it's completely devoid of purpose. It's sort of bleak and cold and harsh. Um, I think it's rather exciting, actually. I mean, I, I rather like the idea that, 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 it, that nothing fundamentally has a purpose. Of course, in biology, um, things do have a kind of pseudo-purpose, which, uh, which is due to natural selection. I mean, a, a bird's wing clearly has the purpose of flying. It's designed for flying. It's designed by natural selection, not by any designer. So there was never a purpose in anybody's mind. It's a purpose that we can discern with hindsight as a consequence of natural selection, that those ancestral birds that flew just a little bit better, because they had wings that were just a little bit better, were the ones who survived and passed on the genes for making wings that were a little bit better. And that process, accumulated over many generations, gives rise to the most beautifully designed wings like those of albatrosses and swifts and seagulls. Um, and so in life, in, bi in biology, it's impossible to resist the language of purpose, but the purpose is not a sort of ultimate designed purpose by a conscious individual. It's a purpose that arises cumulatively by the blind forces of natural selection. One of the hardest questions, or one of the, one of the questions that religious people ask, uh, that you might find difficult, but I'm sure you've been asked it a billion times now, but I'm going to ask it, it to, to you again. It's about the beginning of the universe. How can something come from nothing? Because the sort of scientific principle of cause and effect surely is trumped by that question. Surely there was, there's, there's things outside of science, outside of the laws of science, that perhaps made the universe such as a god. Yes, the word surely is a red rag word. <coughs> um, of course it's difficult, and um, I'm not a physicist, I'm a biologist, but um, I've, I've read what the physicists say. Um, first thing to say, I suppose, is that it's another of these gaps where um, even if science can't answer it, it doesn't mean religion can. And, and there's absolutely no reason to think that because science can't answer a particular question, therefore religion can. I mean, maybe science will answer it, maybe it won't, but if it won't, then certainly religion can't answer it. Physicists are faced with problems like where did the, how did the universe begin? Where did the laws of physics come from? Where did the um, physical constants, the fundamental physical constants come from? Um, and uh, some physicists say it's, it's not a question that they can answer. Some, some physicists say that quantum theory gives them an answer. Um, and I recommend the book by Lawrence Krauss, um, A Universe from Nothing, um, in which he makes the point, and, I, and I, I'm not a physicist, so I can't substantiate this, but what he says is that um, matter and antimatter annihilate when they meet and produce nothing. And this, the process can happen in reverse, that fr from nothing, a random quantum event can produce matter and antimatter. And so it's the, it's the reversal of the annihilation effect. And so he and many other physicists think that uh, the universe began from a random quantum event. And that's the answer to the question, how can something come from nothing? It's disputed what you mean by nothing. Um, but what physicists mean by nothing is not quite what the rest of us mean by nothing. It's a kind of boiling soup of something or other, I'm not sure what. Um, and um, many physicists, including Lawrence Krauss and many others, 
think that they will solve that problem. As I said before, even if they don't, it doesn't mean religion can. Why on earth would one suppose that the, um, that the speculations of some Bronze Age camel herders would, would, have, would be able to solve a problem that modern physicists can't? I suppose those, se those speculations have survived for thousands of years, so maybe there's something, maybe the, the story that they're telling at least is a powerful narrative, you have to admit that. Of course I admit that, but it doesn't mean it's true. I mean, all sorts of nonsense is, 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 is passed on. Um, there is a further point, which is an interesting one, which is that um, the, the laws of physics and the fundamental constants of physics, those things like the gravitational constants, which have a value which physicists can measure, but they can't actually explain why they have that value. Um, it has been calculated that if those constants had ever so slightly different values, then the universe as we know it wouldn't exist. And so there's a kind of temptation to think, oh well, each one of those fundamental constants can be thought of as a sort of knob that you twiddle, um, like a rheostat on a radio set. Um, and all those, all say half a dozen of these knobs, they're all tuned to exactly the right the right value and how, how come. Once again, it's no good saying God did it because you still haven't explained where God came from. That's, that's a, that's a non-starter as an explanation. Um, physicists, uh, some of them have proposed with good reason the multiverse theory. And there are good reasons, independent reasons, to propose the multiverse theory, which is that the universe in which we live is one of billions of universes um, which are each, each of which has a different set of fundamental physical constants. That's to say, in each one, the knobs are twiddled into a different, into a different position. Um, and of those billions of different universes, only the ones that have the knobs set to exactly the right value to produce us, to produce gravity of the right strength, etc., to produce galaxies, to produce stars, to produce chemistry, to produce... To produce um, life, evolution of life and so on. And finally, beings capable of appreciating their own existence. Those favorable quantities were present only in, were, were, were twiddled in, in only the, a few universes, only a minority of the multiverse of universes. And we have to be in one of that minority of universes because here we are. That's called the anthropic principle. It's quite interesting. Um, it's an extravagant idea, but it, it has considerable support from other branches of physics. And it does explain why we perceive the physical constants to be adjusted to exactly the right values. Because if they weren't, we wouldn't be here. And we are here. And so we have to be in one of the minority of universes which has the knobs twiddled to exactly the right values. You certainly do not, and it doesn't help to, to postulate a divine knob twiddler, because you've still got to explain where he came from. Is there ever any evidence for that theory that we can see, that we can look? Yes, there is. As I mean, it, 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 it follows from um, other branches of physics, which I'm not qualified to, to expound. But, I mean, for, for example, physicists couldn't go out and say, well, look, there's the, the other universe, there's another one. We can actually no, point it's not as simple as that. But No, it's not as simple as that. But, the, but the, the, the multiverse is predicted by other branches of physics. A religious person might say, well, I mean, you, you, you've come up with that phrase, other branches of physics. I don't know if that quite counts as there being hardcore evidence for it. Um, a religious well, person... Well, no, it, it does in the, in the sense that, uh, simply that I'm not a physicist, so I, I can't... I can't um, I can't expound it, but, but I, I perhaps I shouldn't have said other branches of physics. Um, there are reasons within physics to predict a, a, a multiverse. And prediction is one of the things scientists do. So there are, there are the, the models that, that, that work in other ways which predict a multiverse. So it's not a case of just saying, oh, we need a multiverse to explain why we're here. It's that there are other reasons to predict a multiverse. And then given that you predicted the multiverse, it then explains why we're here. So those models come up with the predictions, which then come, come up with the multiverse explanation, uh, for example. Yeah, yeah. Right. Religious people would say, well, actually, 
There isn't any evidence for it. We can't see it. You may think there's models for it. You may think there's, it's able to be predicted. You may think there's good explanation, but there's no, you can't go out and actually physically see. And this is your, um, this is your test for whether there's a God. You're you making can't, that well, same no, you, leap I mean, you, of faith. You can't go to get in a spaceship and go to one of the other, other universes. But are you not making that same leap of faith that those, <coughs> sorry, those religious people make when they say, well, actually, you can't see God, but he's there? No, because as I said, um, physicists have reason to predict the multiverse and you'll have to interview a physicist to find out what their reasons are. Let's talk about um, the effect of modern technology on people's beliefs. I'm absolutely fascinated. You've been uh, talking about this for decades, talking about the, the issues that we've raised in this interview for a long time, and over that period of time we've seen the, the rise of the internet, we've seen the rise of media communications, how people consume media and information. How do you think that that has affected people's views on religion, atheism and science generally? It is an astonishing fact, as you say, that uh, uh, during my lifetime we've seen the entire growth of the internet and it's totally revolutionised the, the world we live in. We, we live in the most remarkable world now. Um, I hear we are surrounded by books and people have been surrounded by books for a long time, but now we're surrounded by, I mean, in, 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 in your smartphone, we carry it around in, in our pocket, we have an encyclopaedia of everything that is known, everything that the human species known is accessible to you and me simply by typing a few words into, into, into a phone which we carry around with us. Um, now this is a, a, an incredible revolution in the way we live and it's affected everything and, and it's affected of course uh, religion as well because um, people have access to um, ideas of religion and ideas of not religion in much more full ways, much more accessible ways than we've ever had before. And so um, one of my great hopes is, and I said before, that the, um, that the Im improvement, the, the, the decline of religion in the Western world is not mirrored in the Islamic world. I think the great hope is that as um, computers and the internet become more and more available all over the world, people will become exposed to science, uh, people uh, exposed to free thinking, rationality, and will realize that the childhood indoctrination that they imbibed with their mother's milk is not, um, doesn't stand up. And of course, they will imbibe from the internet religious nonsense as well, and, and we can't help that, it's going to happen. But I'm, what I hope is that people increasingly will exercise discrimination and discernment and winnow out the false from the true. You mentioned Islam there. Now it's interesting, you, you generally make a distinction between Islam, Islam and Christianity in its effect on the modern world today. So you've called Islam, for example, one of the greatest evils um, affecting the world today. Do you, th do, do, you, do you still believe that? Well, that used not to be the case. I mean, in, in medieval times, Christianity was possibly the, world, the most evil effect in the world, most evil force in the world. Um, uh, well, what's happened is that, is that Christianity has kind of been tamed um, only partially, but largely tamed. Uh, and we are now left with Islam as the major religion which actually does things which Christianity used to do, like burning heretics, burning um, and, and killing, I mean, what Christianity used to burn heretics in, in, in Islam, you, you, you behead apostates. Um, and um, so, so yes, to, to, today I Islam has assumed the unpleasant mantle that Christianity had in the Middle Ages. Why is it so controversial for you to say that? Because I know that people have called you in interviews is Islamophobic or use words like that to describe your, your sort of... Well, I wouldn't say I'm Islamophobic. I mean, what, what I am is I'm phobic about killing apostates. I'm phobic, I'm phobic about hurling gay people off tall buildings. I'm phobic about um, forbidding music and dancing and fun generally. I mean, all those sorts of things which are um, uh, sometimes even legally enforced in Islamic theocracies like Iran, um, Afghanistan, um, well not Afghanistan but the, certainly the re regimes within, I mean, for el elements within Afghanistan and Iraq and Saudi Arabia, um, where, where um, Islam actually does in, have a major impact on people's lives for the worse. Why do people find those comments so controversial, do you think? 
Because it is controversial, you have to admit that. I mean, it well, creates, of course it huge, is. It creates mean, huge uh, of, backlash and of, things online of, and everything. Of, of, of course it's controversial. I mean, because, you know, the, the, there, are, there are people who think that when you criticise a belief, you're criticising in the individuals who hold it. And of course, I'm not doing that. I think that Muslims are the, are in princip are the principal victims of those evil things that I've mentioned, such as the killing of gay people and apostates, the oppression of women, the hideous oppression of women. I mean, women are, are the, the main victims of the evils of Islamism. Should we blame Islam for that or should we blame those individuals, for example, who may just have those terrible moral beliefs? For, you know, we've seen atheism, as you've mentioned before, um, in, in, in Russia, in communist societies, where we've had equally brutal, and in Nazi Germany, equally brutal yes. travesties. No, I mean, with should the question we blame Islam? Of whether you should blame individuals or the beliefs that they held, I mean, you can sort of if you get all philosophical and say, well, maybe people are not responsible for their, for their beliefs and so on. Um, that's a matter for philosophers to, to argue about. Um, but uh, when you have a pernicious belief like Nazism, like Stalinism, um, or like Islamism, then um, people, you could say that people are the unwitting instruments of this pernicious belief, or you could say that the people are to blame, and that's a philosophical argument about who is to blame. But what you can say is that the victims, the victims of Stalinism, the victims of Nazism, the victims of Islam, are the individuals who suffer under those, those regimes. If Islam is a pernicious belief, why just so many Muslim? Why are so many Muslims good, fine, ordinary, fantastic? Well, of course they are. I mean, the, the vast majority of people in, in any religion are decent, nice people, and, and of course, the vast majority of Muslims are very good, very nice people, and many of them are victims of Islam, as I said. Let's talk about um, you, the Islam itself as a as a religion. Now, I find it fascinating. You watched. I watched an interview with you and Mehdi Hassan talking about this, um, this exact issue. And he was talking about, and you kept asking him this one question, you said, do you seriously believe that a flying horse went up to heaven? And he, he d wouldn't answer the question. He wouldn't say yes, he wouldn't say no for a very long time. Eventually, he gave in, he said, yes, I literally believe that that is the case. How can a man of the 21st century, a man of modern science, a man with, who has a mobile phone, who can look these things up and, 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 and see sort of rationality, how can someone believe such a belief? I mean, it's crazy. Well, I, I don't understand how he can believe it, and that's why I kept on uh, persisting with the question. Um, what he said was that he believes in miracles, because he believes that Allah can do, can do miracles, and therefore he believes he can do anything. Christians will say the same. If you ask a Christian, um, do you believe in virgin birth? Do you believe Jesus turned water into wine? Um, many will say, no, they don't, but many will say, yes, I do. And the reason is, however implausible, um, they believe in miracles, they believe that God can do anything. They be often they say they believe in the resurrection, and the, re and the, re the resurrection is the one um, uh, und undeniable thing for them. And once you believe in the resurrection, you can believe anything. So they believe, well, if God's capable of, of re resurrecting Jesus, then he can do anything. So why wouldn't he? Why shouldn't he? Um, turn water into wine. Um, and I think that was what Mehdi Hassan was, was kind of saying. He was saying that, that, he, that he believes that Allah is capable of anything, and so why, why not have a flying horse go, go from Mecca to Jerusalem, whatever it was. Islam itself, I mean, it's a huge, huge religion. Um, it's not on the decline, it's on the up. And yet we've seen with Western, in Western societies, Christianity generally has been on the decline. What's, what's the distinction there? Well, when people say Islam is on the up, they, what they usually mean is that there are lots of babies. The number born. of people who believe it, yeah. Well, and babies, born, and that, that, that contains the hidden, not so hidden, pretty obvious assumption that babies inherit the beliefs of their parents, which unfortunately they do. And that's the point I was making earlier, childhood indoctrination. If you assume that every baby born will inherit the beliefs of their parents, then you've only got to do some simple demographic calculations to show which religion is increasing and which is decreasing. Um, what, uh, what one has to hope is that it, it is no longer the case or will, will no longer be the case that every baby born automatically inherits the religion of their parents. Now you're not a, a raging right-wing nationalist, not by any, any case, yet there are still people on the left who would accuse you of being of, of 
being that, I mean, because of your views on Islam, or they would call you Islamophobic, they might even call you racist. I know that lots of people online might say that because of the simple things that you've been saying in this very interview. Is it possible to have a sensible discussion on Islam? Well, it's very difficult, and I don't know why you're harping on Islam so much, actually. It's, it's not, I think not, it's, 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 not it's, it's, that interested in it. It's something that you've talked about before a lot, I know, and you've made that distinction between it's Christianity and Islam. It's not in any of my books. But it is, it is a social commentary that has been happening yes. over the last, let's say, 10 years, and you, you have been involved in that. You've, you've mentioned it and you've talked about it in interviews. That's why I'm asking about it. Yes, well, so what did you ask? The question, the question was, is it possible to have a sensible conversation about Islam? Well, no, it's, it is difficult, and, and um, the, many of the people who, call, who think I'm right-wing are decent liberal people who I regard as my own people. I've always been among, among those people who I regard as cowards because they, um, they cave in and they do not observe their principles of feminism, of gay rights, uh, all the things that decent liberal people believe suddenly they forget about them when it comes to Islam. And I think I know why. I think it's because they mistakenly think Islam is a race, which it isn't, it's a religion. Um, as I've said before, if you can convert to it or apost apostatize out of it, it's not a race. And because they're, as decent liberals, again, extremely against racism, as of course I am, um, they, as it were, the, the fear of being thought racist trumps the fear of being thought misogynist or homophobic. And so they overlook the homophobia and the, and the, the rampant misogyny and the rampant homophobia of extreme Islamism. Um, so um, they, as it were, betray their decent liberal principles in that one case. And so if, 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 what, if, 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 a, if a liberal like me does not betray those principles and does condemn the misogyny and the homophobia of Islamic theocracies, um, they will turn on us and call us uh, right-wing um, Islamophobes, etc., because they have betrayed their liberal principles. I want to pick up on that. You wrote a tweet saying, uh, on that very point you've just made, you wrote a tweet saying, national pride has evil consequences. Prefer pride in humanity. German pride gave us Hitler, American pride gave us Trump, British pride gave us Brexit. If you must have pride, be proud that Homo sapiens could produce a Darwin, Shakespeare, Mandela, Einstein, Beethoven. Do you think that uh, pride in Germany, which leading to Hitler, is equivalent to people voting for Donald Trump, for example, or people voting for Brexit, or those, those issues separately? Yes, I do. I mean, I think, I think that, um, that na national pride is something we need to grow out of. Um, I can't help being proud of some of the things that Britain has achieved, and I think I mentioned Darwin and Newton and Tim Berners-Lee, actually, um, and many, 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 many others. I mean, th th there, are, there are reasons for being proud of, of Britain, and other countries have many reasons for being proud of those countries. But let's keep it in proportion. Let's not, let's not sort of get all jingoistic about it, as the British were and the Germans were in the First World War. Um, where you, we, you know, people were taught that, that, that ten of us, sorry, t ten of them is worth one of us, and so on, um, and and it, it, it largely was that kind of jingoistic patriotism, which fueled the First World War, not the historical origins of it, but the but the impulse to go to war, the reason why young men volunteered in their thousands, patriotism, and. Um, it, it is pernicious. It has been throughout, throughout the ages. We do need to grow out of it and start thinking of ourselves as one human species and uh, think of ourselves less as belonging to, to this nation rather than that nation. Let's take Brexit, for example. Brexit was a vote to leave a political institution, the European Union, that Britain's been in for 45 years now. Um, it wasn't to do with nationalism, it wasn't to do with Hitler, it wasn't to do with World War I. 17.4 million people, 52% of the country voted for something to leave a political organisation. That's all it was. You talk about keeping things in proportion. Surely you're going way, way, way too far by comparing someone like Hitler, who murdered six million Jews, I've never to compared Brexit. Hitler. No, 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 it's nonsense. Um, there, there, there was, I think, an element of xenophobia, an element of Britain for the, for, the, for the British in the way people voted. What I do think about, about Brexit is that it was wrong to determine the future of our country and of Europe um, for, for the long term, for decades, maybe even longer, um, 
on the basis of one vote on one day in June 2016 when um, people change their minds. If you look at the opinion polls, they fluctuate up and down all the time. If you, if you take a vote on one day, um, it's all very well. I mean, we do that in general elections, but we know that in at the most five years, we can have another go. We can change our minds again. This was an incredibly irresponsible decision by David Cameron. I'm not talking about whether Brexit itself is right or wrong, but the decision to allow a referendum on such a momentous thing, such a long-term thing, on one day to be decided by the entire electorate, rather than in, as in a representative democracy by, by, by Parliament, um, was an irresponsible decision which he took because he thought he'd win. He thought that Remain would, would, would win. He was confident that it would win. And he was simply trying to see off the sort of UKIP wing of his own party. It was a, a very, very irresponsible thing for Cameron to do, and we're going to live with the consequences for decades. Do you think the vote in 1975 was legitimate, following that line of logic, to uh, join the European Union? I can't remember. I mean, I don't know enough about that to, to answer that, that question. Um, and possibly not. I mean, if, if, if it was a... Isn't that the nature of democracy, is what I'm trying to say? Well, I, mean, we I have think, these I think we, we have, have a representative democracy. We have a parliamentary democracy where every five years, or often less, uh, we choose our parliamentary uh, representatives who are paid to spend a lot of time deciding, discussing, studying bills, studying the details, studying the economic details, and then coming to a decision. Now, I am not equipped to do that. Um, I could be. I mean, I could spend a lot of time reading up all the economics and so on. But I don't think that I or you or anybody else um, should have been asked to do it en masse. As why? I say, on, because we on, don't, why? What's the main reason? Are we stupid? Is that the reason? No, we're not stupid. Um, but we are, we, we are simply not. We don't spend enough time. D these are complicated economic issues um, which uh, parliamentarians are paid to discuss, to debate at great length, to examine all the angles, and they, they spend hours and hours debating, reading papers and everything. We didn't do that. We just went into the polling and said, oh yeah, I think I feel like voting yes, or I feel like voting no. Um, that's, not the way, that's not the way democracy should work. The Parliament, for example, the Parliament we've just voted in in 2019, Boris Johnson's big majority that he just got, surely even without the referendum, I mean, most of those people in Parliament now would vote to leave. So under, under that logic, well, we, we would again, leave. Again, the, the, the word surely. Um, Boris Johnson, well, they would. Won, I mean, Boris Johnson won the election because uh, be, because he's here to Jeremy get Brexit Corbyn done. Was, uh, Jeremy Paul Corbyn was leader of the oppos opposition. Um, it, so he didn't it, win because of the pledge to get Brexit no. done? Nothing to do with that? No? You, you, you seriously <laughs> think he did? Absolutely. Yes. What, no, not, my, my job in the election was to go around the country speaking to people why they're voting for various people in, in seats all around the country. It was always about Brexit. I mean, a lot of it was about Corbyn, admittedly. It was always about Brexit. It was about up upholding that vote that they had in 2016. If you look at polls, you'll find that Corbyn had a hell of a lot to do with it. And, and I think Brexit did as well. I think it's okay. fair to say. Um, do you think that most Brexit voters are xenophobic? No, I think there are all sorts of different, different reasons. I think, um, I think a, 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 lot of the, a lot of it was um, uh, in, the, in the second. I mean, that, in, or, originally, I think it was sort of rather idle whim. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of people thought it, wasn't, it wouldn't go through. They might as well vote, have a, have a protest vote. Um, I know one person who said, oh, it's nice to have a change. Is um, there evidence to back that up? I mean, do you have well, opinion polls um, to say I'm, that? I'm, as ju you I'm, just, I'm just polls. saying that, that um, people in, tw in 2016 probably had very different reasons to, to, to vote than people in 2019. Um, in 2019, an awful lot of it was, well, we had, it in, we had the vote in 2016, and, and we must uphold that. A lot of people said that. A lot of people said that because we had the vote in 2016, we shouldn't change it. We shouldn't change it now. We should on, we should honour that vote. I never believed that, but that's a lot. What a lot of people did believe. Um, a lot of people didn't like Jeremy Corbyn. A lot. Of, a lot of people um, had all sorts of different reasons. I want to talk about a, a slightly separate issue. It's another tweet of yours. You said under underage people can't vote. Whatever our cr uh, criteria <coughs> for thinking them unqualified, e.g., insufficiently developed reasoning powers or knowledge, there must be some adults less qualified than some underage people. Is age the only practical threshold, or could others be divided? Well, I'm interested in what that. What do you mean by that? I'm interested in that. Um, we do 
obviously for practical reasons impose an age threshold and um, in some countries it's 21, in most countries it's 18, in some countries it's 16. Um, from time to time there's pressure to reduce the voting age to 16. I think it was reduced in Scotland for the uh, Scottish referendum. Um, and um, so there, there's, you can argue about exactly where to place the age threshold. And um, I think what I would like to see would be something like this, that um, for once you're, once you're 18, then you get the vote, and, and that's, that's it. But, but when you're 16, I could imagine having a sort of driving test, a sort of similar to the test which um, would-be immigrants to this country have to take. It's quite a stiff test. I've had a look at it myself. Uh, and it's quite interesting to get questions about British life and things, but you could have questions about democracy and about the issues of the day and uh, um, economics and politics and history and things. And if a 16 passes that test, then they get the vote. And if they don't, then they have to wait till they're 18. Um, and I think that might be rather a good way of, as it were, um, weaning young people into uh, political into an era of into their into their age of political responsibility, so that they they could wait till they're 18 and then just vote in anyway, or they could, if they're interested, they could take a sort of driving test. And I'd rather like to see that. I think it would be a, a a good way of um, allowing those young people who really do know a lot and have the sort of responsibility um, to be allowed to vote that they should be allowed. To to, v to vote. Isn't that a rather a good w way of doing it? It's interesting. Um, I, I do want to, uh, there's one other thing from that I do, do, just want to understand. You said that there must be some adults less qualified than some underage people, and obviously you talk about insufficiently developed reasoning powers of knowledge or knowledge. Which adults are you talking about there? Which adults do you think aren't qualified necessarily to vote? By that logic, there must, you say there must be some. Well, I'm sure there are. I mean, don't, 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 do, you, do you seriously think there aren't? I mean, would you, do you think that there are some 16-year-olds um, who are better qualified than some 40-year-olds? Well, how do you choose what's better qualified? I'm not going to choose. I'm just saying there will, there will not really be some. I'm not wanting to choose. I'm saying let's give 16-year-olds an exam to see whether they should be allowed to, as it were, qualify to vote. And I think that would be a, a very good thing. So nothing to do with excluding some adults from voting because they're perhaps N no, not, not got, no. Got the I'm right saying every, everybody over everybody over over eighteen should vote, should vote. Richard Dawkins, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.